Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And the title of their talk is Minnesota Statewide Bee Service. Catherine, are you seeing my screen? We see your screen, but not uh, now we see you as well. Oh, okay. Good. And you can see my, yeah. Okay, yeah, great. We can see you. Okay, wonderful. So um, that's a pretty tough act to follow. Thanks, Jason. Um, and I swear I wasn't um, trying to copy you on my first slide of the geranium, but perhaps we're both already dreaming of spring. It's not snowing here yet, but it will soon, I'm sure. Um, so you know we're just kind of moving south a little ways and to the east to talk about the a, a similar story here in minnesota with our statewide bee survey um i'm the invertebrate ecologist with the minnesota department of natural resources and um it's been my honor to try to pick up um where Crystal Boyd started this work in, um, in 2015 to document the um, statewide bee diversity here in Minnesota. Um, so similar to Manitoba, you know, prior to us working on this, the bee diversity in Minnesota was really very poorly understood. Um, there was a uh, publication by Frederick Washburn in 1918, where he listed 66 species um, that his predecessor, Otto Luger, had described as being um, bees species from Minnesota. And Frederick Washburn indicated that this list was woefully inadequate. So um, he, he certainly noted that this was, um, that we needed to to do better uh, <laughs> to understand the bee diversity in Minnesota. And you know, my goal here is to understand the, the baseline survey from a conservation standpoint. Without that knowledge of what's here, we really find conservation to be very challenging. Legally, we can um, begin to help these species and conserve them if we, if we know what's here. So we started this statewide bee survey in 2015. I picked it up in about 2018. And the objective was um, similar to Jason in Manitoba to you know, document the bee diversity existing in insect collections um, already and that had not previously been databased and then through contemporary um, sampling of the state. So I'll start with the contemporary sampling to give you an idea of what we've been doing since about 2015. We have set out um, bull traps, we've done quite a bit of hand netting and then some other miscellaneous trapping to try to get a handle on who's here. Um, the majority of our samples come from bull traps, although since I began this project we have um, pretty much eliminated those to this at this point and have focused more on hand netting. I'll show you in a couple slides why that really is. Um, the, the punchline is we, we really value those uh, plant insect interactions and those data that we get from hand netting. Uh, so, you know, uh, more on this in a little bit, but those are, are our methods and our overabundance of specimens that we um, we will continue to honor by by identifying them. Um, our sampling sites are distributed throughout the state. So this is the state of Minnesota and our four eco regions, the prairies in the southwest, the transition zone of the deciduous forest kind of running through um, throughout the, the kind of cross section from the, the northwest to the southeast, and then the Laurentian mixed forest there in the northeast, the boreal forests. So in uh, blue are our sites where we have done bull trapping. Those are primarily sites where we have returned to them about five to seven times throughout the season, um, typically only within one season, um, but sometimes multiple seasons at a particular site. The hand netting sites are just more often than not just a single um, event, a single time that we've gone to a, a single site. So we have about 4,200 total uh, sampling events throughout this time since, since 2015 through now. And, and we're wrapping up, we've wrapped up our, our sampling. We're, we're all done or calling it quits. Like Jason said, we can continue this um, forever, right? And we continue to find new things, but we're, we're calling this baseline survey done at this point. We've um, encountered all of the counties, and although we have some spatial gaps here, we feel pretty good at a, an initial survey throughout the state, um, contemporary survey. So we, we have amassed, uh, unfortunately, a, a lot of <laughs> specimens, fortunately, perhaps in some eyes, um, 
And as I mentioned, we, we want to see those um, through to fruition uh, being accessioned into a, a collection. So all of our specimens, aside from a, a reference collection that we maintain at the DNR, are accessioned into the University of Minnesota insect collection, the UMSP. And um, we work with Dr. Zach Portman primarily at the University of Minnesota, although I know he reaches out to a lot of you all um, for confirmations on identifications. So we, you know, we collect specimens, we process them, we uh, preliminarily ID them. Nicole Gurgitz is the um, main person on this project. I'm just kind of pitch hitting for her today. And she is, um, IDs them and then sends them to Zach for uh, further identification. So um, just to get into a little bit of the results, we have thus far identified through our contemporary surveys 292 species, 25 of which, as Jason was noting, uh, it's really hard to know what's new, right? Uh, so we, we're calling anything that, that we have collected, but the Bee Lab and others that are doing collections in Minnesota may have also collected some of these. Um, anything we've collected that weren't previously in collections as new. Um, I really have become a fan of hand netting. If your goal is to do a, an inventory, we feel like we get a lot more bang for our buck. So I've been running these species rarefaction curves as we've continued on um, with this project and found that we certainly get more species, more unique species by hand netting compared with bull trapping. And although the, the total estimate of bull traps is higher, I expect that number of, of hand net estimates, uh, 278 to go up as we continue to to um, identify the specimens that we've already collected by hand netting. We, we, get, we have 79, almost 80 unique species that have been collected only by hand netting and have not been collected in bull traps. Um, some of those include the Stephoria noviangeli, which is a specialist on pickerel weed that we collected quite a few populations of this year that was not um, hadn't been seen since 1934 in the state, hadn't been collected. Um, we get a lot of specialists by hand netting, which is the other reason we really, we really value that. Whereas obviously if your goal is to collect um, sweat bees or, or, or of the like, um, bull trapping is the way to go. Um, so I, I think it's important if you're doing an inventory like this to certainly um, use a variety of methodologies, but we have come to really value hand netting. Uh, this is the other reason that we have uh, all but abandoned bull trapping uh, in, our, in our efforts to understand the bees of Minnesota. These are the, the average specimens, bee specimens per bull trap event uh, across these different um, provinces, ecological provinces. So this work started in the prairie parkland in the southwest and moved uh, into the, the northeast forests. And we were finding that the we, our bulls are elevated on about a meter uh, being high and maybe that's a, a reason for these uh, the difference I don't know but we aren't we weren't finding very many bees in, in many of our bulls in the forest so um, we, we really weren't getting a lot of bang for our buck um, so that's kind of curious and I would be curious to know from others if you're putting bulls in forests and you're you you are finding bees um, maybe if you're putting them on the ground or whatnot so yeah reach out to me if that's of interest to you um, so so I'll just mention a little bit more about what we have found not go into any great detail but um, we have you know obviously expanded our list of, of taxa that we have found in Minnesota, but we also have expanded distributions. So these are just some uh, some examples. We have these museum records now, which are really valuable. Um, take this Yusur Hamada in the middle, for example. Previously in the green counties are the museum records was only found kind of in that deciduous transition zone there in the middle. But now we know we find it uh, in the prairies as well. So this can get a give us a good handle on um, from a conservation perspective, what is the distribution or the expected distribution of some of these species uh, moving forward as we as we try to understand um, who's where and and how they need conserving. Um, so so how many bees are there in Minnesota? <laughs> Similar to Jason, um, you know, there's these are our neighbors, and we should add Manitoba to this list as well. Uh, in Minnesota working with the University of Minnesota Bee Lab, Dr. Zach Portman and Ann Lane, uh, as well as others. Um, 
we have about 490 species that we have detected and we've detected 292 of them since 2015. So I really think that's pretty good um, given uh, you know, all the other things that, that might be going on with some of these species. So um, who are we missing and why? You know, perhaps this emphasis on a, a, this primarily emphasis on bull trapping early on may have led to a lower number um, we have quite a few unidentified specimens still. There's uh, quite a few Andrina that we're still working on. And by we, I mean Zach, uh, he does a great job. And um, so we expect that richness to increase perhaps. Um, we also, you know, with more targeted sampling of some of these taxa, that we may find, um, we may find them. We also know that there are some species losses, um, in particular the Bombus that we know well are, are perhaps lost. So um, we'll continue with these pursuits despite, <laughs> um, despite needing to stop, I'm sure. Um, but in the ways in which we're going to continue, I guess, are to um, write up our results and contribute to the, the Bees of Minnesota checklist with our colleagues, at the University of Minnesota. Um, our next steps in terms of monitoring from a state perspective are to target some of these bee specialists, these oligolectic bees that might be um, more vulnerable to conservation concern, and then to use these data to inform things like the state list of endangered and threatened species um, here in Minnesota. So those, that's what we're up to next. Um, we'd love to hear from other people, as Jason said, about what we might have done wrong and how you might benefit from that. Um, we are very thankful for our funding sources, the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, which is funded by lottery dollars here in Minnesota that funds this work. And feel free to reach out to me with questions or Nicole is probably a better source as well. So thanks so much. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you, Jessica. We have right now one question. It's from Eleanor and they ask, what are your thoughts on using observations from community members, such as like iNaturalist? Yeah, that's a that's a super um, interesting question. We um, I know that um, I know that on our on our state list that that we're all working on, we kind of try to cherry pick. But you know, um, some of those records that are are on something like iNaturalist that we haven't yet found. Um, but I. I think that it's hard to ID bees on iNaturalist. It's certainly a way for us to maybe try to find things that we should go looking for as well um, and, and provide a specimen as a record. But I think it has potential, but maybe not wholly. Yeah. There is one question. Uh, Sarah Peebles asks, have you accessed trap nest records being done by others in uh, Minnesota? Yeah, I mean, we we certainly talk to the the other folks that are working here in Minnesota and bees on a on a regular basis. I believe that's all the questions. 